Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Glennon, I cannot thank you enough, and I am so excited to talk to you. Oh my God, of course. I'm so excited to meet you and be here. I listened to Untamed, and I'm so glad that I did, because it rehashed so much of my own journey, and I was reflecting a lot. And on our podcast, we also speak to our listeners, and we had a young woman who's going to get married I realized because of Untamed that I think she was asking for permission to leave. I didn't know how to give this to her, but I sure thought about you a lot. Mm. And it is heartbreaking and how common that is. And I was there. I've been married twice. And the idea of the protocol, the steps that we've been taught, this young woman was about to turn 30. And they bought a house together and she doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I know. It was really hard to listen to because it brought back a lot of my feelings in my 20s when I got married at first at 27. And I'm sure that you can relate. Oh, yeah. And there's no end to like what things make us believe that we can't change our minds. I was talking to somebody recently who said that she knew walking down the aisle that she did not want to marry the person who was at the end of the aisle. But she kept thinking, but I've ordered all this salmon mousse. (sighs) I mean, that was her thought. And now every time I'm about to make a decision that I know is wrong, but might inconvenience someone if I make it, I always think, but the salmon moose, like who cares? Donate the salmon moose. Yes. We worry that these things will hurt, you know, our mother-in-law or the cousins that we've invited or whatever. I remember when I got engaged for the first time, my future ex-husband said, so have you called your parents? And I so did not want to tell my parents. I didn't want to say yes, but he had planned the big surprise. They've gone to these great lengths. And so I can't disappoint. This is the refrain I hear so often is I can't disappoint. Glennon, when you first were engaged to Craig, reflection is always tricky, isn't it? I wanted to ask you also how it feels to read some of your early work because all of your work is so incredibly personal and open. So I want to ask you if you have thoughts about that process and if you find it healing or if it's ever cringy. I can't even listen to like older podcasts. Mm -mm. (laughs) But do you remember those times and having that little bit of a gut tug maybe? I actually don't think I've ever shared this story, but I remember before I found out that I was pregnant, talking to one of my best friends and saying, we have to break up. We have nothing to talk about. We can't talk to each other. We have nothing to talk about. Like we can't connect. And actually we weren't connecting physically or emotionally. So, you know, just two small things. (laughs) Remind me, are you about 26 at this point? I was 25, yeah. But you know what? At the time, I was such a severe alcoholic that alcohol was just my best way to unknow ever. I had certainly knowings. Totally. But I didn't have to know them for long because the second they popped up, I would just start drinking or binging or whatever it was. So that was my strategy, I think, for not having to face the thing that I knew. Yep. We got married and then immediately had the baby. And then this amazing thing happens when you have very small children, which is that you get to ignore your problems for years. (laughs) You have to. (laughs) You have to. And you get to. And like you just become this little factory of doing. Yeah. And I truly remember thinking, I guess what I'll just have to do is I'll just have to keep having babies till I die because this is what will keep me distracted enough. That's the train you're on. Mm -hmm. And there's only one track. Right. And for God's sake, we can't be left alone together. So I'll just keep this buffer of child rearing going. Like we didn't dislike each other. We just didn't have anything in common other than, I guess we're trying to do the right thing here. So it was like you didn't even have sort of enough juice to argue. Oh, I desperately wanted to argue. I wanted to get enough traction or passion to argue. That would have been wonderful. We didn't have conversations that were deep enough to even get to that argument place. Of course, you guys didn't have energy to argue. You're raising children and he's involved with his own dalliances. (laughs) Maybe he was arguing with someone. It just wasn't me. (laughs) Oh, God, Glennon, I'm sorry. 
Listen, at the end of the day, what made me the angriest was not even the cheating. It was like, oh, you let me think this was my fault. Yes. You let me think that our lack of intimacy or our inability to connect or my discontent, you know, even the sex that it wasn't good was my fault. Like I really did think it was my fault for a very long time. Glennon, I've always had an unreasonable amount of pride, I guess, a sense of I will not be humiliated. Mm -hmm. But especially in my first marriage, I was accused a lot of being a crazy, jealous actress. I knew that I wasn't. I knew and I hated it that any engagement of like, so wait, where were you? Turned into, oh, this again. And I don't seek out drama. I much prefer to just be chill. But that is a mind fuck. I think that the cosmic and micro gaslighting of women is just, I mean, that's why the most important refrain of Untamed is you're not crazy. I don't even understand what that is. Anna. All I know is that that's what I needed to hear constantly. Like this feeling that I always had. And by the way, it wasn't just in my relationship when I was like, what's wrong? And there really was something very wrong but I was like over emotional or I was suspicious or I was dramatic. It's what happens in our world too, right? Totally. Like I've been sitting in therapist's office since I was 10 years old thinking, okay, maybe I'm anxious or maybe I'm just paying attention. Yes. <laughs> the world is really this bad. Anxiety is a logical response to the kind of world we live in or anger is a logical response to living it as a woman in a misogynistic culture. An eating disorder is a very logical response to living in a culture that tells you to be small and not have any appetite if you're a girl. Right. This idea that actually all of our gut instincts are probably dead on and all of our reactions are dead on. Glennon, you describe yourself as a very sensitive child. Mm -hmm. Part of the an expression of that was developing bulimia at 10. Mm -hmm. I am so sorry. Mm, that was a doozy. And thank you for being open about it. That feels so young. I know. I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old girl now. I mean, what makes me so sad about it, the eating disorder thing is wild, right? But like the two lives... The being 10 years old and having two lives, like a secret life of binging and purging that no one knew about. That's what makes me so sad. It would break my heart to know that one of my girls had that kind of division already. I completely understand the inexplicable desire for a secret mm -hmm. or for that outlet because I think that there's a bit of a search for identity outside of society. And Glennon, would you mind for our listeners giving us the cheetah story again? No, absolutely. So the cheetah story happened when I was just really looking for a metaphor. Because it is a perfect summation. I think so. I hope so. That's what writers are always doing, right? We're just always trying to find something that we can point to that's visible to kind of bring to life a feeling that we're having that is invisible. So all the concepts of Untamed were just swimming around in my mind. And I was inside of a broken marriage to a good man. He's a good man, good father. And that's just a shitty place for women to be because we're supposed to be grateful for what we have and other people have it worse. And like, why can't you just be happy and blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, I was trying and I was also just miserable. I was angry all the time. And I just had this like longing that I couldn't put into words. And I just constantly was thinking, isn't it just supposed to be better than this? At one point after you found out about the infidelity and you were trying really hard to make things work and you were like, this is progressive. I don't mean to put thoughts into your head. You know, the truth of the matter is my kids were so little and I was like, I will not let you fuck up this family. A lot of it was out of fury. I was like, you've done this to me. That's fine. Got it. But I'm not going to let you fuck up this family. Like I'm a bit of a control freak. And I just thought that I could will us back into like a perfect little family unit. I wasn't raised by parents who stayed together. I thought that was like the only option. At the time, I felt like I had bought what culture taught me, which was that a broken family was one that was divorced. Right. I don't believe that anymore. I don't think that success means staying in a marriage forever where everyone's slowly dying. Yeah. I think a broken family to me is one where anyone kind of has to break themselves into pieces to fit in. And a whole family is any family, regardless of structure, when everybody gets to bring their full selves, right? So anyway, I was trying to figure out this metaphor and I was at a safari park and I have no idea what the hell I was doing there. 
<laughs> was it in Florida? <laughs> no, it was in California, oh. actually. I must have been having a lot of mom guilt or something. It's very not in character. But anyway, we went to this thing, which was the big event of the day. It was called the Cheetah Run. And we're waiting with all of these families. We're so sweaty. I remember it being so hot. And this woman zookeeper walks out and she's holding a leash. There's like this Labrador on the leash. And my first thought was, if this woman tries to tell my kids that that is a freaking cheetah, I am getting my $7 back, right? I was like so bitter. And she says, do you all think this is Tabitha the cheetah? And all the kids say no. And she says, you're right. This is Minnie. This is Tabitha's best friend. Tabitha was born in captivity. So we raised Minnie alongside Tabitha. And now everything that Minnie does, Tabitha wants to do. So first we're going to watch Minnie the lab run the race. And then she pointed to this big cage. She said, Tabitha's in there and then she'll run it. So we're like, yay, okay, we get to watch a Labrador run the cheetah race. So the Labrador lines up at this little starting line. And then there's this Jeep with this pink, dirty, stuffed bunny tied to it. So the zookeeper blows a whistle. The Jeep takes off and this Labrador chases after this dirty pink bunny, right? Crosses the finish line. Everybody claps. Okay. So then the zookeeper goes and opens up the cage and Tabitha the cheetah walks out and everybody's really quiet because she's stunning, right? She's like huge and terrifying and her muscles are rippling underneath her fur. And it's really amazing for a second. And then it gets really weird and sad because this gorgeous animal lines up at the starting line. And the zookeeper blows her whistle and this cheetah chases this dirty pink bunny down this like dirty path while everybody just claps, all these spectators and families, right? And you just know this cheetah's done this 10 times today and she'll do it 10 times tomorrow and she's going to keep doing it till she dies. And she crosses the finish line and the zookeeper throws her this like gross, I don't know, Costco steak or something. And she's eating the steak and everyone's clapping. And I'm just like, oh my God, that's it. If a majestic, regal, all-powerful animal like a cheetah can be tamed into forgetting who she is and chasing dirty pink bunnies all day and all night for the approval of strangers, then so can a woman. And that's how I felt was like, oh, wait, maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe this is all my conditioning. Maybe I'm being controlled by zookeepers. Maybe the fact that I can imagine more means that I was meant for more. Yeah. So that's when I just started thinking about the idea of cages and these cultural constructs like gender and religion and sexuality and all of these things that keep us caged and restless. And maybe there's another way. Both times that I've gone through a divorce, I was surprised, although I shouldn't have been, by the support of my family, Mm -hmm. that people around me were so unfailingly supportive, kind. And I imagine that if I was feeling that way with already having a supportive family in place, I can't imagine the pressure that we put on ourselves to please everybody around us. It's almost like, how do we begin to think about what we want? How do we remove the context of everybody else? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's too grumpy and cruel to say in a sense, but if I could tell my eight-year-old son one thing that maybe he would stick to, I would really encourage him to not get married in his 20s. Mm, Jesus. It should be illegal. (laughs) But I bet that your daughters now have such a sense of themselves. They do. That maybe they wouldn't fall into a dependent line of thinking. I don't know. I think there's something to the idea that the first vow we're ever encouraged to take is to another human being. Like we're never even taught that like maybe there's some self-loyalty we should learn first. We say, I love you. We don't even tell people what the I is. You know, I think that there is something to raising little ones who understand that really self-loyalty should come above all else and that there's no relationship that should ever force you to abandon yourself. Yeah. And when you lose it so early. So early. Oh my God. I mean, one of my favorite stories in Untamed is I was trying to figure out in my life, where did I lose that? I have a friend who a couple of weeks ago was trying to make this big career decision and we were trying to figure it out together. And I said, okay, just what do you want for your career? Like, just think about desire. What do you want for your career? And she said, Glennon, I don't even know what I want for dinner. And I was like, that's it. We don't know. We've forgotten how to figure out what we want and where does that happen? So this one day, my son Chase was having friends over and I peeked my head into the room and they were all watching a movie. And I said, is anybody hungry? And every single boy did what I expected them all to do. They didn't take their eyes off the TV. And every single boy in the room said, yes. 
<laughs> they had heard a question. They had gone inside themselves, found an answer and said it. So this is the ideal Q&A situation, right? <laughs> But the girls did something that I will never forget for the rest of my life, which is that in the first moment after I asked, when all the boys were answering, there wasn't a single girl's voice. Instead, what every single one of them did is take their eyes off the TV and they started looking at each other's faces. Yep. Yeah. To find out, Anna, if they themselves were hungry in their own body. In real time, you could see the conditioning, right? So like yep. in moments of uncertainty, boys in our culture are trained to look inside themselves, find an answer and say it. Girls in our culture are trained in every moment of uncertainty to look outside of ourselves for not our desire, but for permission and for consensus and for approval. And so I think it's not a mystery that we forget that knowing, we forget that self-loyalty, we forget that connection to self when we learn how to please everybody else. It's just all about pleasing. You're right. We need like the feedback. I want this, but what do you guys think? I still do it. Yeah. And like, it's one thing if you want to gather consensus because you're considering a throw pillow or like new curtains. Right. But when you're making decisions about love and marriage and purpose and career, there's just nobody else that knows. And it's so funny. We ask our friends, but we know for a fact they don't know what the hell they're even doing with their own lives. But they're our friends. We know that. And we still think that they're going to know what we should do. Yeah. It's so interesting. Glennon, would you mind telling the really romantic story about you meeting Abby? No, I would love it. It's my favorite thing to talk about is Abby's. Well, it was a weird time because I was at my first event, my first public event to launch Love Warrior, which was my memoir before Untamed which was a complicated story about two people sort of trying to get back to each other, I guess, or trying to get forgiveness in the wake of infidelity. But Oprah picked it as her book club. And so when that happened, all the taglines started. And so this book was being touted as an epic marriage redemption story. Okay. It's not really, it's kind of a sad book actually. <laughs> now when I look at it, I'm like, oh, you poor thing, Glennon, you were trying so hard. <laughs> But that's how it was being pitched out to the world. And so I'm at the first event to launch that book and I'm sitting at this table. It was a librarian's convention. Okay. Very sexy. And there's supposed to be a ton of librarians there. But before we went out to speak, it was a table of writers. It was like me and Maria Semple and George Saunders and like all of these very fascinating, interesting writers who were all launching books. I don't know what actors are like, actually, but writers are the worst <laughs> at small talk. Like, it was a painful experience. It was just awful. Like we were all just like neurotic and weird and trying to make small talk. And it was just like a sweaty, neurotic mess. And I was talking to this woman who was releasing a children's book and I saw her kind of like freeze up and she looked over at the doorway. So I turned and looked over at the doorway and there was this person standing in the doorway and she was like 30 feet tall and she was wearing this like long trench coat. She had this like scarf around her and she had like a mohawk and shaved head and like these gorgeous blue eyes. And she looked like a man and a woman and like not either one or both. She looked like cooler than any human being I've ever seen. Ah. Uh. I love also when you write in Untamed how you've never felt cool. I could not relate to that more. My family, it's the joke. Like whatever cool is, I mean it literally too. Like I'm always sweating. <laughs> I mean it like in every way. I can own a lot of things that I am that are good, but I will never be cool. And that's fine. But she had this like amazing coolness and warmth too. And the coolness was so strange in this moment, Anna, because... The room was precious and wise and smart, but it was not the coolest room. Okay, we were like just a bunch of writers. So it felt like the Mockingjay had just landed at our nerdy book party is how it felt. And I just had this unbelievable reaction that I've never had before. And I am sure I will never have again, which was this, oh my God, there she is. Like this very clear understanding that this human being that I had just seen was going to change my life in one way or another, that I wasn't like seeing her for the first time, but that I was recognizing her from something. I think I felt for the first time true desire. I think when I say I fell in love for the first time, like love at first sight, what I really mean is like I was feeling desire for the first time. That's what I think I mean. It was like less Disney and more like, holy shit, <laughs> So I have this gift of just making every single moment more awkward. Like that's what I do for people. <laughs> that's the gift that you give. <laughs> that's the gift that I bring. Yes. And so what I did, although I don't remember doing it, 
it wasn't the conscious decision, but what happened is that I looked down at myself and I was standing up at the table with my arms open like this towards her at the door. So now everyone at the table is turning and looking at me (gasps) because I have done this thing. It was like if the Queen of England had walked in, it would have been extra the way I reacted. It was just so ridiculous. And then Abby was just staring at me now, but I didn't know how to get from here back to my seat. So I bowed. I just thought maybe she'll think I'm a weird writer who like really respects people and I bow when they walk in the room. So now in my family, it's our family's running joke. But that night, you know, she came around the table. We hugged for some reason. Like we just had this very strange night where we were in front of a bunch of librarians and in the midst of writers. And we were just like having this deep connection. And then we left each other that evening. She stayed because she had a 40 million people that wanted her to sign their book. I had like 10, so I had done pretty, pretty quick. And then we started writing each other letters. So we didn't see each other again until we both dismantled our entire lives to be together. Wow. Yeah. That must have been really hard. Like The Bachelor when you can't see each other. It was exactly like The Bachelor in every way. (laughs) I wish our listeners could have seen you on Zoom with your arms like straight out as though you're flying and then bowing. Did Abby, I mean, she clearly clocked it. That must have been so endearing. Yes. I think in retrospect, it was endearing. When I hear her tell that side of the story, when we're doing things together, I just always want it to be a little different than she tells it. (laughs) When every time she tells it, I'm like, maybe this is the time she says she also felt that way. But she never really says it that way. I think her knowing seeped in a little bit slower in that night because truly what she says is that she was really confused when I stood up and threw my hands. (laughs) She was like, what do I do? This woman is strange. That was her magical love at first sight moment. Like open arms and a bow? What more could anyone want? (laughs) Thank you. And in retrospect, when you get over the weirdness and embarrassment of it, I actually feel amazing about it because I just feel like maybe there are some moments in life that are that special, Mm -hmm. like that are that magical. And, you know, inside of rituals, we have moments we bow, we have moments we kneel. That's all I had to do growing up in religion. And this was like a natural one. It was like the most honest. Yes, that's how I feel. It feels weird, but honest. For a woman who spends so much time trying to contain and control myself, it feels wonderful to have not in that moment. My fiance is right here. He's also a producer. But when I first really clocked him, it was in Vancouver. We were working on a movie. He was the DP and I was an actress in it. And there was like a dinner for the producers, you know, midway through the shoot or something. And I got into the elevator. It was a small hotel I was staying in. And the doors opened on like floor seven or something. And Michael walked in and I had this tidal wave of relief to see him. It came out of nowhere. I don't think I had really been paying attention to anything, really, in that time. And he walked in and I said, oh my God, you're going to this dinner too? I'm so glad. Can we share a car? Like, I have one arranged. But that feeling totally took me by surprise. And I found myself just wanting to be close to him all night as though this was safety. Mm. And it totally took me by surprise. I still feel a little floored by it. And he's so sweet. He changed his shoes at the last minute. And now he says, oh, my God, what if I hadn't changed my shoes and I was in the elevator before? Like, (sighs) We do that all the time. We do post-traumatic stuff that never happened. What if it almost happened? (laughs) Only I can create anxiety in retrospect. (laughs) Yeah. We've had to make up different scenarios of how we would have met. If it weren't for the elevator, like you would have been the DP on a different movie. I would have like, you know. (laughs) I love that description of relief. I think that that is the most beautiful word. Is there any better emotion than relief? No. No. And the eye contact. Agree. Five students walk into detention and only four walk out alive. Follow the story based on the number one New York Times bestseller, One of Us is Lying, now a new Peacock original. On the first day of school, Yale set Bronwyn, baseball star Cooper, cheerleader Addie, and drug dealing Nate all land themselves in detention with notorious gossip blogger Simon. When one of them doesn't make it out alive, everyone becomes a suspect, each with their own secrets and motives. 
This juicy teen drama takes unexpected new twists as we find out who's hiding what in this can't-miss new series. With romance, betrayal, secrecy, and more, One of Us is Lying is the murder mystery of the season. So don't miss One of Us is Lying, streaming now only on Peacock. Go to PeacockTV.com to get started. Okay, so do you feel comfortable talking about your worst breakup? Yes, absolutely. My worst breakup was for sure my first marriage, but just not for any of the reasons that I think people assume. It wasn't hard for me in terms of losing that relationship really, because we have a better relationship now than we did when we were married because we're not trying to be romantic with each other. You know, sometimes when people ask me how we work it out well in our divorce, I always think that maybe our divorce relationship is easier because we didn't have any passion in our marriage relationship. And like sometimes passion is hard to dissolve. Mm -hmm. So we were always just kind of good co-parents and that's what we are now. (laughs) So there wasn't that big of a transition, but the reason why it was so hard was not because there was like a deep love lost in the marriage. It was because of the kids. It was because the family unit that was all that they'd ever known changed so much. And because it was the first time I've ever really intentionally and with purpose broken my kids' hearts. I love it that you told them that. Mm -hmm. You write in your book, I'm about to break your heart because I do believe, maybe to a fault, that prepping your children like that is hugely important. Mm. I love the way you raise your kids. I think it is beautiful. I really admire it. When I was 17, I went to University of Washington with my high school boyfriend and he joined a fraternity and broke up with me. He felt so handsomely out of reach, always. That's not accidental, right? That's the way a dick makes you feel. I had my little promise ring. I lost my virginity to him. Of course. Yeah, I lived in the dorms because I was too scared to join a sorority. Mm -hmm. And in that fear, I did something that's common. I feel like maybe you wrote about this inclination to when I was listening to you talk about the homecoming, I was also equating it to award ceremonies in Hollywood. Same thing. Like yeah. out of defense in like the sour grape world, it's like, I'm going to be dismissive of all this fucking shenanigan. It doesn't mean shit. You're too afraid that it will reject you before you can reject it. Anyway, but that breakup was so much about a hot guy not liking me. And I was a very much a late bloomer. And I tried out on a bunch of different identities during college, which I guess is important. But that was tough. I remember just sobbing and writing poems and intentionally putting myself in miserable situations so I could physically feel the pain, like standing out in a rainstorm for hours. Uh. But let me get back to you. What intimidates you? I'm always afraid when I'm in the activism space. When I'm doing that part of my life, I feel always afraid of doing it wrong, of hurting people. I've gotten to the point where I am not afraid of the right people being mad at me. Like I'm regularly pissing off people that I'm meaning to piss off. But when I hurt somebody because of a lack of perspective or because of my limited experience, that kills me. And it's usually because I really have fucked up. (laughs) I spend some time when it happens feeling sorry for myself. And then I usually end up in the place where I actually did make a mistake and I learn from it. So I've learned to kind of trust that process. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it happened to me last night, actually. I don't know when I will learn that like whenever I'm not my best self on social media, it never ends well. I don't know why I can't like the second before I do it, remember all the other times this has gone wrong. But I wrote something about lateness. I was just being really judgmental about lateness. And I'm not usually judgmental on social media, but I felt strongly about it yesterday for some reason. So I wrote this thing about lateness. And then there was just this outpouring of hurt and sadness because of the ADHD community and people who are committed to understanding neurodiversity and how actually lateness is a manifestation in many ways of certain neurological differences. And so for my people, I am square in the mental health community, right? I am like someone who's struggled in surviving, thriving with depression, anxiety. I am in this community. So to hear me speak in a way that sounded so judgmental and off of people who are in my community and are used to being protected by me 
was devastating for a lot of them. So for me, it's like when people are mad at me or offended by me, that's okay. I can deal with that. But when they say I've hurt them, like this hurts, then I want to die. Oh God, I know I'm often late, but I really don't have an excuse like other than bad scheduling or maybe being too optimistic about traffic. I mean, I did learn that lateness is personal for people. And listen, <laughs> I know that there are many different layers of how people responded. And some of it has to do with neurodiversity and some of it has to do with, ow, 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 that hurts personally. <laughs> so yes, agree that there are many different reasons that happened. But the general consensus is whenever I'm an asshole, it doesn't go well. So like, I can't understand why I can't remember that. The minute before I'm being asked is all I'm saying. I love you. Okay, what is the talent or ability you would most like to have? So I'm sure there are some that are more meaningful, I guess, or world-changing than this one, but I've always really wanted to be a really good singer. I love that. I would so love to just be a singer. My daughter is a singer. Tish? Yeah, it feels like just almost as good. I used to, you know, with my curling iron, sing in front of the mirror. Glennon, I think this is good. I think this is a birthday goal. I've tried. I started taking guitar lessons, actually. Oh, good. I have been singing a little bit. I actually believe that I could be an inspirational singer for people, but Abby disagrees just mightily. But I just think there's something to be said for people who do things publicly that they're not great at. Yeah. Everybody does things publicly that they're great at. And that's great. I mean, that makes people feel like, oh, they're good at that. But it never makes people feel like, oh, I could do that. But if I sang publicly, <laughs> it would be inspiring. <laughs> people would hear it and be like, oh, my God, like if she's doing that. <laughs> so I'm not giving up on it yet. I love this. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic philosophy. Oh, Glennon, I wanted to ask you, what is a trait you dislike in others? And what is a trait you dislike in yourself? I really, really dislike interrupting. It's a thing in our entire family. I don't like it when people interrupt other people. And I think it's because I'm so obsessed with listening and I feel like everyone has a different capacity for sharing themselves. And sometimes it takes people longer. And so I just don't like it when people interrupt someone. My family makes fun of talking this way, but it feels almost violent to me because it's so important to me to hear people share themselves because that's what saved my life. So when somebody finally gets up the courage to do it in little ways, because they're not a fast speaker or they're not a whatever, somebody else interrupts, it's very deeply upsetting to me, like in a way that might be overkill. The thing I dislike about myself the most is I think I'm judgmental and I think that I am extremely controlling. I think that that makes my most intimate relationships difficult because I'm scared all the time. And I think it makes me suffer a lot. I think that's what anxiety is about a little bit. It's like feeling like everything will go out of control if I'm not spinning all the plates all the time, or if I'm not worried enough, things will go bad. Yes. <laughs> like I actually believe that I worry my family into positive outcomes, <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel like sometimes when Abby will say, see, it all worked out. I have to bite my tongue and not say, oh, well, Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. Why the hell do you think it worked out? Why do you think it worked out? Yeah. I earned us this. Because I worried. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 100%. Okay. This is an unfair question because it's so broad, but what relationship advice would you give? I think since I just got into my first healthy romantic relationship a hot second ago, I probably wouldn't offer romantic relationship advice right now. But I think if I thought of that question more widely, how do we live in relation to ourselves and other people? What I would say to young people and especially young girls is that, you know, it's been my job for the last 15 years just to really listen deeply to women. And what I hear them saying most often is two things. One is I want to do this. I need to do this. I want to be this, but I'm so afraid of disappointing, like what we were talking about in the beginning that I feel like it would not be an exaggeration to say that 80% of all of the women that I talk to are not living the life they want to live because of disappointing someone else. Yeah, And I just think that there's a deep, deep tragedy in that. You know, my daughter came home a while back and she said, mom, Chase wants me to join these clubs at high school and I don't want to be in these clubs. And I said, okay, well, fine, then don't be in the clubs. What's the big deal? And she said, well, I don't want to disappoint him. It was just like this little moment that scared me so much. And I said to her, Tish, your job is to disappoint as many people as it takes throughout your life so that you never disappoint yourself. That's your whole job. 
And she said, even you? And I said, especially me, honey. Oh my God, like how many women, men, all people, do we know that are 40, 50 years old and still living to not disappoint their parents? And their parents have been dead for 20 years. Yeah. That's the ultimate untaming. What a gift you gave her. What a powerful gift. That's all I want her to do. It's like every time we live to not disappoint someone else, every time we abandon ourselves, make a decision against what we know is right for us in order not to disappoint someone else, we are constantly choosing to disappoint ourselves then. And then I think about that word disappoint. And as a word person, that freaks me out. Think about what we're saying with disappoint. That means we are de-appointing someone that somewhere along the line, we have appointed as the guide of our life, as the most important person. Yes. In work, relationships, everything. Yep. If I had advice to give to young people, it would be don't avoid disappointing other people. Make it your life's mission. Wake up every morning and be like, who do I need to disappoint today as the guide of my life so that I can appoint myself? What we don't understand is when we live to please other people, we are screwing everybody because we're ruining our relationships with those people. Because then we live in bitterness. We live in martyrdom. We live in quiet, seething anger against those people who never asked for us to sacrifice our lives on the altar of their wishes and needs. They lived their one life. It's our job to live ours. God damn, that's powerful messaging. I thought a lot about your cheetah analogy, especially with my profession, because the way it's structured, I mean, unless you're on a TV show, you are out of a job every three or four months. The chase is constant and necessary if you want to make a living doing faces and saying lines like I do. <laughs> it is awfully confining and mentally confining. That is one of the great things about getting a little older is releasing some of those things. It's just unfortunate. Same. And I think that you and I at 44, we are in an odd place in society, especially in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. Like I struggle a lot with my relationship with social media and I yearn for the days of like phone on the wall or, you know, having the kinds of conversations that my mom used to have for hours in the kitchen or whatever. I can sort of divide my life by decades. 20s I view as foolish and overly generous, although I was very selfish, but I should have been more, I think. 30s, sort of this odd middle ground. And 40s, I have more of a sense of definitiveness, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm slowly gaining it, maybe. Yeah, I think about that all the time. For me, I feel like the 20s, I was just bad. I was just like rebelling against everything. I mean, addiction was that, like all of it was just, I'm just going to rebel, disappear. I'm going to be bad, right? And then it was, I'm going to be good. This is my last chance to be good when I got sober. I'm going to be a good girl. I'm going to be a good woman. I'm going to be a good wife. You're going to write those thank you notes. Yes. I'm going to be all the things I could never be when I was bad. I'm going to be good. And then I realized, oh, you know, through experience, like being a good wife didn't protect me from infidelity. That doesn't work either. Being bad didn't work, but neither just being good. So I would say that for me as the 20s is bad, 30s were good. And then the 40s is like, what's free? Because when you think about it, bad is just as much of a cage as good. Because if I'm rebelling against culture, culture is still defining my behavior. Right. There's nothing creative about it. Like being rebellious, going against the man just means you're controlled by the man. 100%. And then goodness, living in compliance constantly, chasing all the dirty pink bunnies, that's a cage. So 40s is like, wait, if those ideas and expectations and ideals were never there to chase, what would I do? What would I be? Like, how do I create my sexuality, my faith? my life, my marriage, my family, my career? How do I create it from inside out, not from outside in? I guess I have to start working, Glennon. <laughs> I know. No, I'm sure we'll figure it out soon. Next Tuesday, we'll have this nailed. <laughs> Glennon, what do you think is the meaning of life? I hope it's love. I hope it's love. The only times I don't feel like I should be doing something else or that I'm wasting time or anxiety is when I am on the couch with my wife and kids. And actually, usually when we're watching TV, which means that it's not even talking to each other, <laughs> together time unengaged is the meaning of life to me. Glennon, I would love to get your thoughts on the appeal of The Real Housewives and why do I love it? 
Here's what I wonder. I wonder if the appeal of it is in some way tied to what you just said about you wishing for those long conversations that your mom had at the kitchen table. Like if there were a show that was kind of reality based where women behave better with each other, then maybe I would watch that too, but there just isn't. So I'll listen to women talk to each other when they're behaving any which way. That's what I like. I just like watching women hang out with each other. I admire their (laughs) candor, the exposure of themselves without second thought. Same. That's what's marvelous about it. It's like, oh my God. Like talk about people who are not even trying to be good. Yeah. Wow. Here I am eight hours into worrying about a tweet about lateness. Right. And you're just, oh my God, that must be amazing. It must be. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I don't want to be it, but I sure do want to watch it. Glennon, I cannot thank you enough. You are just as amazing as I knew you would be. And I love your wife and I'm so happy for you. And thank you for sharing and analyzing your journey and putting these feelings into your book. Mm -hmm. It's really wonderful to hear your voice. Have, Have you listened to it at all? God, are you kidding? No way. You're so funny. Glennon, you're really, really funny. I was cracking up a lot. But I view it as a service, and I really appreciate it. Mm. So please know that as you're agonizing over the tweets, it's only because people want you to like them. Oh, that's so (laughs) kind. Thank you. I will take that. And you are just as charming and wise and wonderful and generous as I thought that you would be. So thank you so much. I've loved every minute. Good. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, Glennon, so much. (laughs) Okay. Bye, Anna. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Going to therapy is just like a lot of things we already do. We get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. We go to the gym to maintain physical wellness. And we brush our teeth because we don't want them to fall out. Going to therapy is like all the above. It's routine maintenance for your mental and emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind healthy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and unqualified listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Ferris. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash F-A-R-I-S. Chris, hi! Hey everyone, April Beyer is back, now officially as my much-needed co-host. As you know from previous episodes, April brings great advice, insight, and years of experience. I am so thrilled to have her. Hi, Lexi. (laughs) This is so exciting. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Oh, thank you so much for doing this, Lexi. Will you tell us what's happening? Sure. So I have this friend. We've been in each other's lives since we were eight years old, all the way through high school, pretty strong through adulthood. As life got in the way, we didn't always communicate as often as we could because just life. But when we did reconnect, it was like we picked up where we left off. But it seems like overnight, she just stopped responding to me. (laughs) She wouldn't return my text messages. She wouldn't return my calls. I was more concerned, like, did I offend or did I do something? Which is weird because if we did have an issue with one another, we were the type to come to each other and like, hey, this situation bothered me when this happened or I felt uncomfortable when this happened. That was just our dynamic. And when she wouldn't communicate or talk to me, it was just confusing. She did finally reach out, but she says that I'm emotionally manipulating her, that it's unhealthy. I don't need to see you every day, which is false. We don't see each other every day. (laughs) 
I was just kind of hurt about that because I thought our bond was a little bit stronger than that. Okay, we're going to get into this. Okay, <laughs> do it. Go dive right in. I need you to tell me about myself. <laughs> okay, well, Lexi, do you mind in your letter, you write that you're getting married? Yes. Do you mind if we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So I asked her to be in my wedding, of course, <laughs> and she accepted. We were communicating throughout what we were planning, got her dress and everything together. Unfortunately, because of 2020 and COVID, the wedding didn't go as planned, but we were strong during that point And then just completely like, nope, I don't want to deal with you anymore, basically. And I would talk to my now husband and he says, oh, you just need to let her go. She's obviously not not your friend if she could do this to you. But it's kind of harder for me because he doesn't really know how close we were and like how involved we were in each other's lives. So for me, it's kind of harder to just let her go. I know that friends come and go in, out of your life. I just didn't think that she would be the one that wouldn't be in my life anymore. Aww. April, what do you think? Well, Lexi, you know, I can hear the pain in your voice over that. It's happened to all of us. I don't know about you, Anna. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. But we've all had friends that were lifelong friends, and then suddenly it, there was a break or something. I want to give you one little glimmer of hope, which is some of these things have seasons to them. Relationships do, friendships do. Some things come back. You know, I had a friend that I didn't speak to for, gosh, 15, 20 years, and now we're the best of friends. So don't lose hope. Is there anything, Lexi, that happened in her life? If this is such a U-turn for her, anything that's going on in her life that might have caused this behavior? Well, I know the last time that we actually had a heart-to-heart, -heart, she kind of broke down about dealing with things with her family. She was kind of always the backbone in her family. She's the youngest and she kind of had to take care of everything by means of keeping the house clean, watching the kids and preparing dinner and making sure her father was taken care of. And recently he had to go through some surgeries and I know that that was hard for her. So I would take it upon myself and just check in on her, see if there were anything that I could do to help take that burden off of her like we used to do when we were kids. And she just wouldn't say anything. I didn't take it to heart in the beginning because I figured that's how she was going to process things. But when she reached out and said that I'm emotionally manipulating her, it just threw me for a loop. Like, I'm just trying to be a friend and be there for you, not trying to force you to do anything you don't want to do. When you guys were friends, like in elementary school, you know how when we form those early relationships, when your identifiers as a human are kind of simple, like I was the short girl. Oh, yeah. And I had a good friend who was beautiful, like all the guys liked her, but she grew up with really rough circumstances. Like she had zero home stability. I know that that element was really rough for her. So it created this imbalance in our friendship because she envied my family life. Mm -hmm. So those kind of childhood identifiers can carry with us right. with those kinds of relationships. Did you guys have that kind of imbalance? I would say so. Now that you put it in that perspective, looking back, yes. Like I said, she was primarily the sole caregiver, so to speak. Yeah. Me, on the other hand, I didn't have those type of problems or issues. Did she ever say something like, you have it so easy? Or maybe if she never said it overtly, could you get that sense from her? Yeah. I would go to her about some issues, you know, growing up, you have those arguments with your mom or whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, I hate my mom so much. And pretty much what you said, you have it so good. You have this, this, and that. They do this for you. Me, on the other hand, I don't have that. And I didn't, as kids, of course, I didn't really make that connection or realize what she was saying because she was kind of the more level-headed person between the two. I can see that, yes. Yeah. Were you guys close enough before you got married that she could have felt like your husband would be taking you away from her, do you think? Or were you guys not quite like that tight at that point? No, she was with someone at the time too. And the boyfriend that she had, I didn't really connect with him. So I noticed that I kind of distanced myself a little bit, mostly because she was really focused on him. I mean, it was really kind of hard to get her attention sometimes. So I kind of distanced myself, not purposely, but we would always find some type of way to communicate with each other. Even after I started dating my husband, she was there. 
after marriage is when it kind of switched, but nothing changed on my end until I started asking, hey, you want to go get a drink? How are you doing? I miss you. You know, what's going on at home? Can I help you? And then nothing until just one long text message. Until the emotionally manipulative accusation. Yes, that one long paragraph that she sent and just really kind of hurt. I thought that we were stronger than that. Like, tell me what's going on. I'm all about closure. If you don't want to deal with me, fine. But tell me about myself so I can make myself a better person in the future. I suspect that the confusing element is that nothing has changed with you, but maybe shit has changed with her. And you're now married and you're happy and you're stable and you want to go grab drinks and like, you know, yeah. whatever hardships. It's not logical, Lexi, yeah. at all. And that's the hard part. But I think maybe her place of comparison is too much of like, maybe it's making her angry illogically. I don't know. April, is that the way humans work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I just think that there's something specific. I keep wondering if there was the event of her dad. I don't know what that surgery involved or how traumatic that is or was, yeah. how close they are. There's something there that I would love for you to explain. And also, I'm kind of getting the feeling that this relationship has started to evolve into something else for a while, like long before your wedding planning and such, even though you guys were still able to every couple of weeks kind of get together and talk. So you're dealing with that, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just, we're all growing up. Right. A lot of friendships, I don't know how old you are, but I feel like right around 30, a lot of the relationships from the 20s start to kind of shift. Your pool of friends gets a little smaller and tighter and we have to let go. I think what you're dealing with is not so much about letting go of her. It's about you want an explanation. And I'm also hearing you kind of blame yourself a little bit. <laughs> don't you think there's always like a searching when things don't add up and you can't help but think kind of like what? Yeah, but you can't turn on yourself. I love, Lexi, that you want to grow and learn about yourself, but you can't make your first stop. What's wrong with me? Like right when we started talking with you, you said, hey, Anna, April, <laughs> tell me what I'm doing wrong. That's your thing. And I have a feeling that because she's always been the responsible one in her family, that your love, even for her, translates as pressure. And it's not what you're doing. It's just, you know, when you've had a meal and you're just really, really full and you just can't possibly take anything else on, that's, I think, what the bigger picture of what's happening here. So I want to know more about what's going on with her dad, because caregiving, if you've ever done it, is hard. Yeah. And you know, when you're caregiving, especially a parent, you don't even know your own name. So what's going on there? He's been sick for a while. I know he was doing a little bit of drinking and stuff of that nature. I know the surgery that she was speaking on, he ended up losing his foot and the infection moved to his other foot. So he's a dub amputee now. And she was kind of talking about that process and how she was trying to cope with taking care of a father who wasn't the best to her growing up. Oh, yeah. But Lexi, do you understand what that feels like? I mean, again, it's hard enough to care for a parent that you love. Yeah. But when you're having to care for a parent who wasn't good to you to begin with, you resent. <laughs> yeah, Anna, you have so much resentment that the resentment can completely take over. And even a friend calling and saying, what can I do? It's like, just everybody get away from me. Like, don't even talk to me right now. Yeah. I don't even think she's aware of what's going on. That's what she's not dealing with. When she said, you're emotionally manipulating me, my first gut reaction would have been, okay, can you define that for me? What does emotionally manipulative mean to you, to her, right? Mm -hmm. And then I could double check with myself and go, okay, sounds to me like everybody, not you, everybody in her family has done some emotional manipulation. And so you're just an extra in the movie, so to speak. She could be getting like texts all day long. Did you pick up that thing for dad? Did you get, oh yeah, you know, whatever yeah. all day long. And then to have, you know, her best friend say, hey, what's up? Haven't heard from you. Maybe, like you said, April, it was interpreted as pressure. Yeah. It's pressure. It's like when somebody passes away or you're dealing with a trauma and people call to say, what can I do? Mm -hmm. It's almost the worst thing we can do for that person. Because even though we're offering a hand and help, it's just another person we have to be responsible for. 
I know it sounds weird, but even on my birthday a couple of weeks ago, I got mad because I was having to return too many calls. It's <laughs> like, why is everybody calling and saying, can I take you out? Can I? And my husband goes, are you kidding? People want to take you out for your birthday. Isn't that nice? I'm like, it's too much pressure. <laughs> what if Lexi sent over something really special? That's what I was going to do. I was thinking yeah, great to idea. do that, but I was scared. <laughs> Lexi, everybody loves a gift of any kind. <laughs> I honestly was thinking of doing that. But when she said that, I'm like, okay, maybe that's too much. Maybe I should just fall back a little bit and kind of like, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it's meant to be type of thing with her. Lexi, you know, what's really nice about this friendship that you have with her though, is that you're not angry. Like you're hurt and you're confused, but you're not like, I'm slighted. It's really kind of beautiful that you're reacting in an open way that you want this friendship. Yeah, she's trying to save yeah. her friendship, which you love and adore. And yeah, Anna's right. It's so beautiful. I love your idea, Anna, about the gift, but I think the gift has to have a little note on it that's really short. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like thinking of you, I love you. I'm here whenever you want to reach out, whenever. Like I'm just here for you holding space, right? Yeah. Just say, I'm here for you holding space. And the gift has to be for her. So when you're caregiving, you're tired. Like an awesome like bath, yeah. like spa, yeah. like yeah. mud mass. Anything for her. Or it could be like gift certificate to the nail salon or just something. I think like a big basket is super fun. Just something specifically for her to take her mind off things. Yeah. I mean, her dad is a double amputee for God's sake. I mean, that's really tough. And that means like every single thing he needs. She probably doesn't sit down. Yeah. She's been responsible her whole life. She's too young to be this old. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. She never, ever got to be a girl. She never got to be taken care of ever. So you trying to take care of her, you would think that you're filling the hole. But when we don't recognize what love is or being cared for feels like, we reject it. Yeah. You come from love. So your backdrop is that. So of course you would receive the notes, the calls, the texts in the proper way. So we can't push our agenda on other people just because that's how we would want to receive it. We have to think about her life. And if you love her, and it sounds totally like you do, I love Anna's advice about the gift basket, and it's filled with just goodies for her, anything that is an escape, mm -hmm. whatever, and then just say, I'm holding space. I love you. I'm always here for you. That's it. I do have a question. If I do send that gift to her, or like a goodie bag or whatever, do I just leave it at that? Do I not reach out and just like wait for her to come around? Do not reach out. Lexi, if I were you, I would send like something that feel a little extravagant to you. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, but if you say, did you get the basket or what did you think? No, Lexi's going to play it cool. She's going <laughs> to totally play it cool. Yeah, play it cool. <laughs> this is like dating. <laughs> yeah, I know. Be hard to get. And your friend is probably going to cry. And I would bet she would reach out, you know. I'm hoping so, because I do love her so much. And it's, like you said, it's more so confusion on my part to try to understand what's going on and the process things, because that was not our thing. We would always come to each other and express what our feelings were. Yeah. And now it's nothing. It's not about you, Lexi. And I think the, the minute you realize it isn't you, you're going to treat this differently. She's coming back. And also the new guy in her life might have some influence on her. And she might be also just busy with that. You said she kind of put a lot of focus on him. Oh, yes. Did they break up? Yes. Oh. Maybe a couple months before the wedding or so. But they've always been kind of off and on type thing. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot going on in her life. Yeah, poor thing. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, you know, when you love somebody, you have empathy for where they are in their life, right? That's real love and affection for someone. So letting go isn't, screw you, you're out of my life. It's, I'm going to give you your space and just know that I am here when you are ready and not worry so much about you. She didn't phrase it correctly. You know, she's not a shrink. And when she said emotionally manipulative, that wasn't coming from a textbook. That was just the first thing that came to her mind. Mm -hmm. So let that go. Don't worry about it. You're not manipulative. You're just coming with love. And it's a lot. When the hole is so deep, you just keep filling it. And it's really, really hard for her right now. Let her kind of get on her own feet, so to speak, and find her own pathway back because your friendship is only going to get back on track when her life feels good, when she's no longer a 
24-7 caregiver, when she's got the job she loves and the man she loves. It could be five years from now, two years from now, and let that be okay. You have a lifetime of friendship ahead of you. And Lexi, my final word. <laughs> <laughs> are, you know, just show her your love through bath products. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I feel like you'll like that. Hopefully. <laughs> I think Anna needs a basket. <laughs> I'm sending you a basket, Anna. <laughs> I love you, April. Don't you promise me that. Girl, it's showing up on your doorstep <sighs> tomorrow. Lots of bath products and a mud mask and a nail file. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lexi, congratulations, though. Thank you. And I think that you're a wonderful friend, and I know that she knows that, and you can just buy her love back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Lexi. Good luck 